So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today for Joe Baker's presentation on Longborn. Um, I'm sure some people will come in, but if you guys have any questions that you guys think of as we go through, feel free to put it in the chat. We'll have a Q&A at the end, and then that way if you don't want to forget what your question is, it's in there and we'll get to it. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. So first of all, we'll go ahead and introduce Joe. Thank her for being here today all the way from England. So thank you so much, Joe, for coming. Um, um, so Joe Baker is the author of seven novels now, including Longborn, A Country Road, A Tree, and most recently, The Body Lies. She's also written for BBC Radio 4, and her short stories have been included in a number of anthologies. Um, her upcoming novel, The Midnight News, is due to be released during the first half of next year, 2023. So she lives in Lancaster, England, where she's joining us today with her husband and their two children who are not joining us today. They're downstairs <laughs> cooking and getting prepared. So thank you so much, Joe, for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me along. Can everybody hear me? Is it coming through? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So um, thanks for having me along. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening, this morning for you, this evening for me. Um, welcome to the dim and <laughs> crepuscular Lancashire winter. Um, I thought I'd begin by reading um, a little bit from the beginning of Longbourn. Um, there might be the occasional person who hasn't read it. I don't know what, whether you, uh, you all know it or not, but I thought it'd be a good place to sort of begin to sort of set the, set the tone and to give a taster if you don't know it or, or maybe just haven't read it for a while. And it's a good place to begin discussion. So I hope that's okay. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so uh, this is the UK edition. Uh, it's just the one I happen to have with me, but there you go. Um, there could be no wearing of clothes without their laundering, just as surely as there could be no going without clothes, not in Hertfordshire anyway, and not in September. Wash day could not be avoided, but the weekly purification of the household's linen was nonetheless a dismal prospect for Sarah. The air was sharp at 4.30 in the morning when she started work. The iron pump handle was cold, and even with her mitts on, her chillblains flared as she heaved the water up from the underground dark and into her waiting pail a long day to be got through, and this just the very start of it. All else was stillness. Sheep huddled in drifts on the hillside. Birds in the hedgerows were fluffed like thistledown. In the woods, fallen leaves rustled with the passage of a hedgehog. The stream caught starlight and glistened over rocks. Below, in the barn, cows huffed clouds of sweet breath, and in the sty the sow twitched, her piglets bundled at her belly. Mrs. Hill and her husband, up high in their tiny attic, slept the black blank sleep of deep fatigue. Two floors below in the principal bedchamber, Mr. and Mrs. Bennett were a pair of churchyard humps under the counterpane. The young ladies, all five of them sleeping in their beds, were dreaming of whatever it was that young ladies dream. And over it all, icy starlight shone. It shone on the slate roofs and the flagged yard and the necessary house and the shrubbery and the little wilderness off to the side of the lawn and on the coveys where the pheasants huddled and on Sarah, one of the two long-born housemaids who cranked the pump and filled a bucket and rolled it aside, her palms already sore and then set another bucket down to fill it too. Over the eastern hills, the sky was fading to a transparent indigo. Sarah glancing up, hands stuffed into her armpits, her breath clouding the air, dreamed of the wild places beyond the horizon where it was already fully light, and of how, when her day was over, the sun would be shining on other places still, on the Barbados and Antigua and Jamaica, where the dark men worked half naked, and on the Americas, where the Indians wore almost no clothes at all, and where there was, consequently, very little in the way of laundry, and how one day she would go there and never have to wash other people's under things again. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I love that introduction, by the way. Oh, it's just, it, it really sets the stage for the whole book. So um, so we'll jump into the interview. We'll get into a little bit more for those of you who haven't read Longborn a little bit about it in just a minute, but we'll just kind of set the stage. So I think it's safe to say, Joe, that you're possibly a Pride and Prejudice fan <laughs> at minimum, and probably a Jane Austen fan of some of her other works as well. So can you tell us when and how your love of Jane Austen developed? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, when I first published Longboard, I didn't actually know the answer to this question. It sort of came back to me through the process of people asking me around it. And um, it was when I was 12, I first read Jane Austen. And I realized that because I made friends with a girl called Emma when I was 12. We were streamed at school and we were sat and we, she and I were the same level for everything. Apart from maths, she was much better than at me than maths, than me at maths. Um, and so we ended up next to each other for almost every class. And she, we got to know each other. She introduced herself. She said, my name's Emma. I'm named Emma after Emma from Emma. And I just looked at her blankly, <laughs> no idea what she was talking about because we didn't have Jane Austen in the house. My mum had been badly taught it at school and didn't like Jane Austen at all. So we just, we had loads of books, but we just didn't have any Jane Austen. And so my friend, my new friend, Emma, who is still one of my oldest friends now, started lending me her paperbacks. And I still, I can still visually, I can still remember the Emma that she lent me. It was a white one with a sort of bluish kind of vague illustration of a Regency lady on the front, you know, very sort of late 70s, early 80s um, kind of uh, book design. And yeah, so I, that's, I was 12 years old. Emma got me started on um, Jane Austen and I've been reading and rereading her ever since. Wonderful. Well, it comes through. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if you kind of answered in there, but do you have a favorite Jane Austen novel? Is it Emma or do you, you know, Pride and Prejudice or one of the others? It's changed over time. Like it's sort of at the moment, like right now, this minute, um, I think it's probably fairly common as we get older. Um, persuasion's my thing. Yeah. Um, that, um, you know, love snatched from the jaws of loss is just so beautiful. The, the hanging on when all hope is gone is so and, it, and when you sort of, you map it onto her biography, it's particularly heartbreaking. You know, we write the stories that we'd like to live, I think. Um, and I mean, I can't speak for her, obviously I can't speak for her, but it just has that kind of echo in her biography that just really gets in my heart. And I remember the first time I read it, I found it a bit sort of, it didn't, it wasn't quite the sugar rush that Pride and Prejudice is. Um, and when I first read it, I didn't love it quite so much. And I always remember thinking like the first time when I was maybe 14 or whatever, 13, 12, thinking, oh yes, 27 is quite old. And she is really left on the shelf at 27. Um, and then you know, by the time you're reading it in your thirties or forties or whatever, you just, the tenderness for this such a young girl to feel so lost and so like overlooked at such a young age. Um, you know, my empathy sort of goes out towards her more as a motherless daughter, really, at, at that stage. Um, yeah, so it shifts and changes. I think that's the amazing thing about Austen is there's always different ways into the novels. There's always different perspectives and, and new things to find and, and new favorites as right. well to emerge. Right. No, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think I, I think you're right. As we get older, a lot of people do shift toward persuasion. So. Yeah. Um, how about any favorite heroine or hero or minor character in any of Jane Austen's works that just stand out at you, that speaks to you in some way? Do you have any favorites there? Well, I suppose it follows on quite logically from Persuasion, but Wentworth is my favorite um, Austen um, fella, <laughs> if I can say that. Um, and I, I, you know, people argue a good Darcy and I, I don't, you know, I don't dismiss Darcy at all, but Wentworth's got a boat, you know, I mean, just the, 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 and the opening out of life that I don't have any qualms, really. I, I have questions and Longbourn asks some of these questions. I have questions about the ending of Pride and Prejudice. Mm. Um, I just, I want to know a bit more. I'm not sure. I'd be worried slightly. Um, but in in Anne and, and Wentworth's relationship moving forward, I just see the world opening out for her. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, I, in terms of minor characters, I mean, I love that thing. The extraordinary thing about Austen is that feeling that every one of these characters has a hinterland. 
that there's you could follow any one of them down the street and into another house and know that there's this whole other story going on there. Everyone has that fully imagined roundedness. Even if you just glimpse them, you know, you know that there's this whole other world that, that is their life um, that you could dive into if, if she'd so chosen to. Um, and so it's kind of hard, hard to narrow it down. I love, she's got such a way with a narcissist. Mm -hmm. I love her narcissists. They're so brilliantly drawn. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's, it's very hard to narrow things down. But I, I think, you know, if you're if you're asking me for the favourite hero and heroine, which indeed you are, <laughs> I would probably <laughs> have to go Anne and went with it at the age I am at now. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so getting in a little bit more into Longburn. So for those here today who maybe haven't read Longburn, which I'd be shocked if there's many of you, but for those that may be there, can you just tell us a little bit about it and describe its relationship to Pride and Prejudice? Sure. Yeah. Um, hints were there in the opening section, I like to think. I think all of Longbourn kind of is demonstrated to some degree in that opening section. So Longbourn begins um before the initiating incident of pride and prejudice um just before the arrival of the new family at uh, netherfield park and it it ends slightly after the events of pride and prejudice um but where they overlap my story is mapped very closely onto pride and prejudice so the idea for me was that you could overhear a conversation that's happening in, in Longbourn, you can overhear voices that are, are being spoken in Pride and Prejudice, that you can open a door and walk into a scene, um, or a, a character in Pride and Prejudice will walk out of a scene in Pride and Prejudice and walk into um, Longbourn. So it's, it's, my intention was to map it on very, very closely, but it's not Pride and Prejudice. It's, obviously Pride and Prejudice exists, so I didn't need to write, even if, oh God help me if I could, but it's not an attempt to retell Pride and Prejudice. It's not a version, for me, it's not a version of Pride and Prejudice. It is a, the, the term I coined for it is a subquel. Mm -hmm. It's what's going on beneath Pride and Prejudice, underneath the other story. So below stairs, what I'm interested in are the servants, the servants' lives, the servants' stories, so it's not just them glimpsing this other bigger story that's going on, it's them having big important things happen in their lives and challenges and difficulties and passions and mistakes and endless chores. <laughs> no, that's a wonderful way to describe it. Yeah, that it's 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 really one of the most interesting like Pride and Prejudice adjacent like or mm -hmm. you know stories I have ever read. I I'm a big fan of it. Um, so how and when did you first get the idea to write Longborn? When, how did you get this idea to kind of tell the servants' yeah, yeah. stories? Yeah. Um, I think with every novel I've ever written, it's a combination of, of different elements. So the stuff that's been hanging around for ages in your, it, somewhere back here, but you don't even know, it, it just seems completely inert. It's something you happen to know. And there's maybe two or three of those things you happen to know. And then some other elements of drips in on it and it's a catalyst and it starts to react and starts to fizz. And you start to think there could be something there. There's a, there's a thing happening in my brain and I need to, I need to, to um, find out more about that. So in this instance, for this novel, it was loving Austin, reading Austin, from the age of 12, just making it, it was such a key part of my imagination. I just loved losing myself in those books. I adored spending time there. I, you know, it was a little bit later in life. I was a student by the time the, um, the beautiful BBC, the lush, beautiful BBC um, series came out. And then full-fledged adult by the time the Joe Wright Pride, Pride and Prejudice came out, but I would just absorb and just devour those things as well. So I loved losing myself in that world. It's my comfort reading. I took Pride and Pre Prejudice into hospital when I went to go in and have my son. I thought I would read that on the labor ward. Didn't happen, <laughs> but um, that was the idea at least. Um, so loved Austin, always knew I didn't quite belong there. Like for most many people, 
the probably the vast majority of us. If you trace your gen, your ancestors back just a little way, you know that there's quite a lot of people in service. And I'd always been aware that my my mum's family, her mother and her mother's sisters, had worked in service because we had bits and pieces around the house that dated from that time. So bits of old silverware and some old prints and a few bits of old sort of crazed china. It was said of the aunt, it wasn't my nanny, my grandma who, who collected this stuff, it was her, her sister Anne. And it was said of Anne that she was no better than she should be. What we don't know is was she gifted this stuff because she was carrying on with the master, which was one of the suspicions around her name, or was she just stealing stuff? So they were quite small things, the kind of thing you could imagine you could like slip up a sleeve or behind a, you know, an apron or something. And anyway, so, so when I'm, th I was in Austin's world, loving reading these books, I was also knowing I didn't quite belong there because my family, my ancestry, my my roots are in the working class. So it was a bit weirdly. This whole novel came out of the failure of imagination. I could. I couldn't imagine myself going to the ball, but I could imagine myself scrubbing the petticoats. You know, I couldn't put myself in Elizabeth Bennett's shoes, which is the whole point of that novel is to put yourself in Elizabeth Bennett's shoes. But I could imagine myself cleaning Elizabeth Bennett's shoes. Um, and that that was just sort of around. And I suppose I was aware of of the presences the, of the servants, hyper aware of the presences of the servants in the book because I was rereading it. And I noticed a kind of, so you do pick up on them. There's Mrs. Hill, there's a butler, there are, there's a footman mentioned, there's two housemaids who are mentioned, one of whom gets a name, which is Sarah. Um, but there's also these functions that happen. So it's a form of words. It's like the carriage was brought round, a message was delivered, the meal was served. And all those passive constructions imply human presences in the room who are not being I know they're there I just I sort of like think, I know they're there my my people are in that room and that's kind of how I can be in Pride and Prejudice because my people are standing around serving soup so I could be there but I can be there on those terms so there was that kind of awareness and then alongside that I just was rereading Pride and Prejudice um, one time. I wasn't well. I was at home, duvet, sofa, you know, comforter and sofa kind of day. And I got stuck on one line in Pride and Prejudice. And I remember just going absolutely just staring at it. And I was no longer in the story. And I was just staring at this line of text. And it's the run up in the, to the Netherfield Ball. And we know, all know the weather's been dreadful. Um, the roads are thick with mud, the footpaths are impassable, there's no way the Bennett sisters are going to head out in that kind of dreadful weather. And so, <clears throat> and the line in Pride and Prejudice is, the very shoe roses for Netherfield were got by proxy. And I thought, who is proxy? Who is this figure that's being sent out in this bad weather to go and get shoe roses, which a little sort of I'm sure we all know the little pom pom flower things that go on your dancing shoes. Um, so absolute fripperies, completely inessential, just like fun things that the girls want to have. Proxy has to go out and fetch them. And my question was, how does she feel? Very soon she became she, and very soon she became Sarah because that was the one name I had for a sort of young presence in the book. How does she feel about going out in this weather to fetch these frivolous things? so that other girls can go and dance at a ball that she has no hope of attending. So it's, that's how it sort of came together out of a sort of bunch of disparate stuff. And then that one line that was the catalyst really, the little drip of something else, that was the catalyst that made it start to fizz. Wonderful, thank you. Um, which that kind of answered my next question. So I'm going to pass that one by. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was going to talk about you, ask you about your family history, but you told us all about okay. it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so writing a novel based on another author's work is obviously a daunting task, especially when it's a classical author, especially when it's Jane Austen. So mm -hmm. how did you approach writing Longbourn and what were challenges that you faced as you were in the writing process? Yeah, um, I was relatively lucky. I think because I was completely oblivious to it all. 
<laughs> really. Um, first of all, I didn't know about any of the, the spin-offs. Um, the, well, some of them didn't exist at the time, obviously. Um, but it was only when I went to check if someone else had already used my title was that I realized how many other people have also written around Austin. It wasn't something I pursued before. Um, so I was oblivious of that. I didn't have a um, publisher, so I didn't have anyone sort of breathing down my neck about it. I was between contracts. I was just writing it for my own pleasure. It was something that I, it was a place I wanted to spend time as I was sort of suggesting, this is somewhere I would love to be. And these were terms on which I could be in that place. And I've always felt that writing is just like a more intense version of reading. So for me, it was almost like a reading experience. It was making this world up such a fangirl, such a ridiculous fangirl. It's just a kind of sort of elaborate piece of fan fiction, really. Um, so because it was kind of private and quiet and sitting in the corner of a cafe in Lancaster, just doing it for my own amusement, it didn't really have any exteriority. It didn't have any sense of what will anybody say. Also, up until point, up until Longbourn, I'd published what three novels? No, four. Four novels, um, but very, very quietly. You know, handful of reviews, <laughs> handful of sales. Um, and wasn't used to any attention. So just didn't really think about attention or being noticed or anything. It was literally for my own fun, really, that I was doing it. Um, and it was really only, so in some ways that really just removed a lot of the challenges. Like just, it was just me, you know, in the same way as you might pick up a craft project or, or, you know, a sketchbook or something like that. It was me doing this for my pleasure and, and entertainment. <laughs> um, and it was only when um, I sent it to my agent. Um, well, what happened was it was the autumn of, it was this time at 2012. So this time, 10, a decade ago, 10 years ago. And my husband said to me, like November, he said, you do realize this time, like next year, he said, this next year is the 200th anniversary of the publication of Pride and Prejudice. And I put my head in my hands and wailed because I just, I, I hadn't noticed. I wasn't paying attention. I'm not a numbers girl, you know. Um, and I just thought if I don't get it finished before that, I am just going to miss the moment. I mean, to be honest, like, I don't think it would have been a problem. But at the time, it felt like everybody's just going to be overwhelmed with Austin. Nobody's going to be interested. I was wrong about that. But that's how I felt at the time. So I rushed to get a draft finished. I've been just like, doo, 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 just like working away quietly by myself. And then I just thought, oh, well, I'll just get it in and see what Claire says. And I sent it to Claire and she was really, really, sorry, Claire's my agent, um, really excited by it. And started sending it out. And then we got a bit of an old bidding war going and then the international sales started coming in and I just got a little bit hysterical. And, <laughs> and kind of unplugged from everything. It just became, I, I just felt absolutely overwhelmed by it. And the noise was too big and people had lots to say and not all of it was nice. Um, one, and this was often, be, you know, before people had read it and in some cases before it was even published um, because people make judgments and people assume that you're doing it for cynical mercenary reasons. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it hasn't been financially helpful but it was not it, no, it didn't begin with a cynical or mercenary uh reason so I kind of had to put the the you call them American you call them blinders I had to put the blinders on um because I it was just absolutely paralyzing the amount of attention and noise after being so quiet as a writer for so long mm. so um I just, I just stepped away from it. So in some ways, like I have dealt with the challenges by ignoring the challenges or being mm. unaware of the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> um, does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I think we're all glad that you just decided to have a little fun, <laughs> even though it became stressful <laughs> toward the end of it. We're, I think we're all happy to say that you were just having fun and being creative. So uh, thank you. Um, all right. So 
Uh, Jane Austen wrote in her own time and obviously a sphere of life in which she was familiar. So what was it like to really delve into the history and research of the serving class for Longbourn? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like we, we sort of, we tend to chintzify her a bit. Um, but when I, I find a, a sort of slight digression here, but I find it really fascinating to look at her prose because we spend, if we love Austen, or a lot of us anyway, we love the clothes and we love the houses and we love the decor and we love the detail and we love the hair and the flowers and the ribbons and all those lovely, lovely things. And none of that gets a mention. And I find that really fascinating. Um, the only thing that gets really fully described in that, in those terms, like the sort of the, the thinginess of things, the physicality of things, the, the beauty of something, because of when she was writing before people really started to, or just at the point where people, romanticism was making us start to notice views and such, um, is Pemberley. That's the only thing that she really stops to look at in Pride and Prejudice. Um, whereas for me, because my, serve, my people in the book, my characters are dealing with the physical world all the time. They're dealing with clothes, they're dealing with um, meals and food and, and fires and floors and weather. Um, and it's all like a kind of tangible, practical, physical relationship. Um, that was one thing that I really had to go elsewhere for. Um, so that involved a combination of things, really. My, my research is usually sort of for everything I do, it's kind of like, I suppose, sort of three or four different layers. And there's the obvious kind of wide sweep of history thing you just have to do to know what's happening when more or less. <laughs> um, and then there's the um, the more sort of specific, so you can get fantastic, few fantastic books about domestic life in the period or um, servants' lives during the period. Um, Amanda Vickery and Carolyn Steadman have done amazing jobs of collecting what evidence there is, the laundry lists and the diaries and the letters and, you know, very often talking about servants rather than being written by servants, of course, because literacy issues. Um, and then I, I got, um, I did some practical stuff like just trying out techniques around the house so that I would know what that was like, um, though obviously I've got limited access to I mean, I, we went for quite, when we were really broke, me and my husband were like two, like he was a playwright. I was a PhD student. We had no money. We had no washing machine. I used to hand wash quite a lot of stuff when, when we were first together. And so I'm sort of used to I'm, that kind of thing. I've done that heavy washing, but by hand, um, which is quite weird to admit to, to a bunch of strangers. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, but it does, you know, you don't know you're doing the research at the time, but it all feeds, all life sort of feeds in. Um, there was another thing, the use of tea as um, a cleaning product. Um, you, first of all, you can mop with tea, uh, not everything, just wooden floors. Um, and the tannin brings out, um, the, it, it brings them up beautifully and it's mildly antiseptic as well. And tea leaves and and in our old house, I remember my my little boy watching me strewing tea leaves around the floor. And he was absolutely just like jaw dropped. It was like, Mom, what are you doing? You know, just making the place like throwing what appeared to him to be dirt around the house. But that gathers up dust. It lays the dust. So when you sweep, it just sort of comes together rather than poofing back up in the air and then just settling again. So a bit of that practical thing. And then another of those things that didn't know it was research at the time, but um, my, the village I grew up in. Um, so I grew up in a village, which, you know, in, in a way just kind of helps set you up for that kind of limited sense of the sort of small social world thing and everybody knowing each other and in and out of each other's pockets, with <laughs> dining with four and 20 families, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and the, my best friend at the time, Ruth, um, was the vicar's daughter, and they lived in this rambling Georgian vicarage. And it was all 
you know, there's not that much money in the Church of England. Famously, the curates, you, you know, never have any money, but the vicars don't really either. And the vicarage was very underdone up, you know. Um, so this was the 1980s, but they still had this huge echoing kitchen with like a little, you know, the range was still there, the big old metal cast iron range, but with a little electric cooker plugged in beside it, you know, and big scrub table. And then outside there was the old sort of yard area and stables and all the little different sort of sort of buildings that would like there was an old necessary house um and there was an old apple store and a coal store and all these different storehouses and there were at the stables at, at the back of the stables there was a ladder that you could get up to the stable loft, but you weren't supposed to, because it was dangerous. I think a little bit of that crept into Longbourn, the places you're not supposed to go to. Um, so that house, the vicarage became, when I was writing the book, I started to sort of realize that I was thinking about that house and channeling how that house was laid out and the different, what these call offices, the, you know, the kitchens and storerooms and stuff like that. And, for me, I sort of, it wasn't intentional, but I sort of became aware that that's probably about the right level for Longbourn House, which is just the biggest house in the hamlet. It's not as fancy as Netherfield Park. It's way, way less fancy than um, Pemberley. Um, and it's often, it's thought to that Longbourn, the house in Austin is modeled on the Steventon Parsonage that has been since, um, destroyed um and so it just sort of feels about right for the level the sort of the gentleman's residence and the vicarage it all just sort of seemed to map over each other so does that answer your question yes it does yeah no I like um, that there's you know the academic side of the research but also a practical side not every author does that so that was really fascinating so um kind of continuing a little bit with the research was there any really interesting rabbit hole that you went down because I know when you research you know you can go off on all sorts of tangents yeah. was there anything that you went down that didn't make its way into the novel that was just really fascinating or interesting to you about service or um servants in that era or just the era itself yeah um I, I, I did, I did get quite sort of absorbed by the, the sort of just stuff that wasn't appropriate for context. So mm -hmm. you sort of realize if this household is this size, then they won't have this or that or the other, or they'll be managing in this way, you know? So you, I mean, I remember finding out that big households often had a special dog that would, um, that was, would go around in a, like a huge hamster wheel by the fireplace and that would turn the spit in front of the fire and I would have loved to have got a little dog in a sort of like hamster wheel turning a spit to cook the Sunday roast for the um for Mr Collins um but I couldn't justify that little dog <laughs> and the hamster wheel and the spit so that never got in there and I spent an all I spent quite a lot more time trudging around the Peninsula Wars um, in um, the middle section of the book and um, was coaxed back a bit from, from that um, in, um, in editing um, because I just, it just went off on too big of a digression on, on the war adventures. Um, but I think, I think that's the thing. What, what I, my process of, of, you, of writing historical is, sort of I'm just I, I'm constrained or I put this constraint around myself that it has to be something that people are encountering like I don't I don't want to have this sort of sense of you arrive in the room and everything gets described in the room um it has to have a kind of a filter um of consciousness so what matters to Sarah is limited by her you know her immediate concerns um and she wouldn't feel the need to tell you about certain things but would find other things really really important um so in some ways i'm forever shedding stuff or, or pushing to one side stuff that i have i do know but isn't right in her voice or doesn't fit with this particular point of view um so it's, it again, it feels a bit like blinkers. You've got to sort of keep it sort of within 
their perception. So in some ways, that's why I wanted to go off on those different trajectories to, you know, um, the war and, and other places to sort of step outside that, the bubble, the, the sort of the, the metafictional bubble as well, but the bubble of, of, of Meryton and, and Longbourn. Right. Well, we're going to get some questions about you stepping out of that bubble, but I do have kind of a more personal question about the Regency era and service. Since your family historically was in service, if you were a servant in Regency area, is there anything that you think you would actually find rewarding about the job? Or what do you think you would just despise if you were <laughs> setting yourself in your character's job and role? In Sarah's role, specifically in Longbourn House, or just um, any of the characters, or if you just put yourself yeah. back in the Regency era yeah. as a servant. Yeah, I think, I think I would enjoy the clothes, but they wouldn't be my clothes, which I would find difficult. Um, and I also think probably I've not, not actually worn Regency gear. I you'd have to be tiny to get into that stuff, but uh, even replica stuff I haven't haven't really um you know worn but I imagine the discomfort of wearing them probably you know <laughs> balances against the beauty in some ways um I I I I think that just those I the, the textures and the and and the fabrics are something that I would love to get my hands on but as I said I think I'd feel really really insanely jealous that I was just doing all this laundry for and I think that probably comes through in the book the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the jealousy of <laughs> of other people's lovely things um one thing that um I think I would find service very very hard honestly um because yeah my politics rebel against it um but um I love that idea that what Sarah can do that like the Bennett girls can't do is she can go she can leave if she can find herself she can go to a hiring fair or get herself employed elsewhere so there is that just that thing of that's that's one bonus really of being a servant as opposed to being um one of the served is you can take your service elsewhere um and so I quite like that element of it that you can you can just decide that okay no had it I'm off though obviously what you're off to is somebody else's house to work um but there is a certain element of freedom in that um and I guess also I mean I, I suppose I'm coming back to class again but just the, the there is a sort of freedom accorded to um behavior from Sarah's class that that um the Bennett girls wouldn't be able to you know would would just be destroyed by it would be socially you know they'd be outcasts if if um they were uh if if they behaved in in the ways that were perfectly acceptable I mean I was shocked this is part of my research I was shocked to find that it was perfectly acceptable for working people for the woman to turn up pregnant at the altar visibly pregnant not a bother completely normal in fact if she didn't get pregnant before they got married you might decide to dissolve the engagement because obviously something wasn't you know that so um that for example and, and that's like contemporary with people like um oh names will escape me but i'm thinking of mansfield park um is it mariah i can't oh, yeah. remember but, child, yeah yes yeah. So, you know, that's her, her life is over. She's just yes. got to go and, you know, just, you know, she, she can't be accepted back into society. Right. So there's, that's quite interesting. I, for me, I found that very interesting in the sense of that there being sort of some liberties accorded to the, lo the soi-disant lower classes mm -hmm. that are not accorded to certainly women of the upper classes. Right. All right, so we'll kind of get into um, some of the change, not changes that you made, but some of the different angles that you looked at. So yeah. starting with uh, just some of your characters uh, are portrayed a little bit more harshly just compared to the original text. Not that some of that stuff isn't in the original text, but you bring it out yeah. more, um, yeah. when, especially when viewed from the servants' stories, such as yeah. Mr. Bennett, 
Mr. Wickham, and even to a little bit smaller extent, Lizzie, more just ignorance on her part. But um, while other characters you're a little bit more sympathetic with, such as Mrs. Bennett and Mr. Collins. So knowing Jane Austen fans, I'm sure, and you kind of mentioned it earlier, there's been some criticism um, of maybe some of the sides of the characters that you've explored. So why did you decide to take that route with your character development? Um, and how do you respond to the criticism that you do get? Um, well, I respond to it by ignoring it. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> because it's not valid, but just because I did like, you know, there isn't time in the day um, and there is there are more books to be written. Um, so to answer the second part of your question first, um, to answer the first part of your question is for me, it's just a shift of perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, and it's also just finding little bits in Austin and pulling them forward. And I think Austin is quite hard on um, Mr. Bennett. Um, she is quite hard on him. Um, I just pulled away a little bit further at, at those threads, that thing of marrying his um, agents, his accountants or his agents or a solicitor's daughter or something like that, who was pretty um, and, and just was really the current Mrs. Bennett, obviously, but when she was a pretty airheaded girl. Um, and how, I don't know, I suppose I'm just asking moral questions around that stuff, like, you know, so he marries the wrong person and then just treats her horribly for the rest, you know, just mocks her, digs uh, digs away at her. Obviously, a lot of it just goes over her head, but that doesn't, you know, so Austin notices this stuff too. Austin's talking about this stuff, um, but I maybe just pull a little bit further at, like, why is that relationship so bad? Why is it so toxic? Um and suggest something that did happen quite a lot um, in the era, um, those relationships. Um, Mr. Collins, oh God, I, I feel so badly for Mr. Collins. All he is, he's 25, you know, again, again with the, like once you pass the character's ages and, and look back, he's just a boy, you know, he didn't have a great time at university, he didn't make many friends, it's not his fault he's half educated and awkward, um, and you know, we'd all love to be as sparkling and glittering and, and brilliant and beautiful as Elizabeth Bennet, but we're not, and all of us have got, or at least I certainly have, a bit of a Mr. Collins inside me, you know, who's just, person who, who says the wrong things who makes we've I think that there is that side to a lot of a lot of people's characters we can't all be you know in the in the way that fictional characters can be can always have the right word deliver the line perfectly in real life we're all a mixture of all this stuff and I just empathize so much with with him and his awkwardness and I think particularly when you remember what as Austin does that he's 25 um, and I think to some degree it gets a bit blurred out by the adaptations because, you know, we, we can, we consume those with, I, I can consume those with great enthusiasm, but because in the Pride and Prejudice one, um, again, casting, not Pride and Prejudice one, the BBC one, cast much older, I forget the actor's name, he's brilliant, but he must be 40, 35 at, at least. And 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 it's um, Tom Hollander, I think, in the in the um, yeah. Sorry, the Joe Wright version, yeah, yeah. And so again, like you know, he's he's not ancient by any means, but he's not twenty five. And so someone who's not grown out of their awkwardness is someone to be a bit more awkward about than someone who's still just going through their awkward phase. Um, so yeah, and I also like, sorry, I'm, I'm rabbiting on here, but like, again, I sort of feel intense sympathy. I, th I suppose it's just from so many rereadings of Pride and Prejudice, rereading them to sort of read the stuff that isn't there as well, but breaking those spines to like shreds. But Mrs. Bennett, I think, you know, I, I'm approaching her as a mother myself, rather than as a teenage daughter, when you shift that perspective from you know, the first you know, first impressions, the draft, uh, the early draft of Pride and Prejudice was written when Jane Austen was, what was she, 19, yeah, I think? So, somewhere around yeah. there. And like, 
you know, maybe she even, maybe she completed it when she was 19, in which case maybe she started it when she was even younger. Um, and to me, there, there is just that sense of a slight, uh, risky saying this out loud in Austin context, but <laughs> there is a slightly teenagerly approach to Mrs. Bennett in the writing, in that sense that it's just like, oh, mum, everything is excruciatingly embarrassing, whatever mum does. It's like, she's just the most embarrassing creature on earth. And she is, because she's written as such, but just that, 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 that way into the character, that decision that this woman is the most embarrassing thing she, that they can, she will always say the worst thing. She will always humiliate you in front of your friends. This is teenage girl's version of what a mum is. Um, and, you know, once you've, you've passed that and you're past the teenage phase and you're looking back and you're still rereading your Austen, you can see, and this is the genius really of, of Austen or as part of the genius of Austen, that you can sort of see it from the other side and you can see that there's more to her than that, even if she's not like, you, she's not a glittering wit, but she does mean it's come, it comes from love, it comes from concern, it comes from a very real awareness of what life is like for unmarried women. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I don't know, have I answered your question? Yes, <laughs> no, I think you have, lots, definitely. Lots of yeah. concern and empathy for minor characters, I think. <laughs> No, I love it. Um, so one of the other things that you address is a little bit of the seedier sides of Regency England. Um, so to me, one of the most disturbing scenes is when Sarah actually observes a soldier being flogged, which of course Catherine and Lydia kind of mention in very brief yeah. passing in Pride and Prejudice itself. Um, so why did you actually choose to include this scene and really delve in and give detail about it? Sure. Because it's horrible. Um, it's, you know, it's really, really, it's a really horrible thing to happen to a person. Um, and it's part of normal life in this world. And it's glimpsed in Austin. Um, and it's one of those moments that you're just reading, well, for me, just reading, rereading Pride and Prejudice and just going, excuse me, what? Like someone's been flogged. And you start to think about what the reality of that is. Um, and the, the girls can just mention it offhand I mean it, it's telling you about their characters when Austin has them speak about about it flippantly that's them being flippant <laughs> um but it just made me pause and it's just one of those little like I wanted to think more about what these militia these young men who they are what they do what their life is like because in Austin's novel, they are um, eye candy. <laughs> they, they're romantic, um, romantic possibilities. They are, you know, men in red coats looking hot. Um, but I just, you know, I just started because of that line, because of, and she sent me all the clues, to be fair, the clues are all there. That line made me think like, okay, so what is the reality of this? Um, and aside from just like the fact that that's permanent scarring like and massive trauma and potentially, you know, if you get infected, death um, for that, serv that, that soldier, um, just unpicking that side of, of that world and thinking about the reality of, of that. And I, this is a sort of longstanding in, interest in, in, in class and politics in Britain, but at the time, well, okay, so the militia is not the salt, there's not the army. It's it's a specific element of the army. And it's the element that stays home while other people go off to fight Napoleon. So what they're doing there is, well, Merison's not coastal, so they're not there to <laughs> defend the coast against the invading French hordes. They're there to keep the garrison there because there might be unrest. Now, um, a little further north with the, the Chartist, no, sorry, the Luddite riots are going on yes. um, around the same time. So like, and then a little bit further north still and a little bit further on in time in, in, in um, 1816, we've got the Peterloo massacre in Manchester. Um, so these are, 
people who are trying to keep their jobs, trying to keep food on their table, they're being put out of work by new, um, the men are being put out of work. The, uh, the ones who bring home the biggest wage, the kids can still work, the women can still work, the men are being put out of work and they're being brutally crushed by militias and yeomanry. So in Britain around this time, the people that Austin's, Austin's these girls are flirting with, are the same people who are charging down women and children at the Peterloo Massacre a few years later on or, or crushing the Luddite riots a bit further on. And so it was just pulling at threads. It was just pulling away at threads and, 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 and stuff started to run in different directions. Right. It's all there. It's all there in, in Pride and Prejudice. It's just, just little tiny gl glimpses and clues. Right. Um, so one of the things I really enjoyed, too, is you chose to introduce not only a person of color, Ptolemy, but also yeah. an LGBTQ plus and Mr. Hill, yeah. kind of bringing that out a little bit. Um, and we obviously know they were present in Regency England, but they're so often underrepresented. So why did yeah. you choose to bring that forward in your narrative? Um, well, the Ptolemy... Um, there was always a there was always going to have been someone who was bringing notes messages that hot press piece of paper had to get from um netherfield to um longbourn um but it was only really austin's um letters the collected letters um which are glorious um but it's it's clear from one of them that one of her neighbors had a black servant mm -hmm. um and I just thought, well, obviously this opens up this whole other aspect of Regency society and where the money comes from that's funding these beautiful houses and these lavish balls. And it comes from sugar and it comes from slavery. Um, and it just seemed that it, because it was present in her letters and because I needed a man servant to come from um, Netherfield to Longbourn, it just seemed to like, to twist together in, in, and, and that became Ptolemy. The reason he's called Ptolemy is just, I once knew a bloke called Ptolemy. And it's just, <laughs> it's just too good a name not to, um, um, to bring in, but also there's that practice of naming that was done. You know, that like you, you, slaves were named with the, the sort of the, the family name and, and names allocated that wasn't a parental choice. So it just seemed to me like one of those things that old Mr. Bingley might have done. Um, but also because, you know, a nice bloke called Ptolemy once lent me a coat. So, and he, you know, just that, um, one of the things I really like about Ptolemy, the character, but, well, also Ptolemy, the chap, um, is that sense of, um, he's a bit of a cad. He's a, well, not a cad, he's a bit of a, ladies man he's 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 got that sort of charm about him um but the he's also really sensitive so he would i do think he would lend you his coat if you needed it definitely yeah uh, wonderful um so at the end of longbourn and again there's spoilers here everyone it's been out for 10 years so um sarah and james returned to longbourn after obviously yeah. the threat to james yeah from Wickham, from the Napoleonic Wars, all that kind of come together. Um, so at the end, and obviously a little bit past it, do you believe this is now actually a safe haven for Sarah and James returning, or does Wickham still pose a threat to them after they return? Because obviously he's still in the family, there's still a chance of him yeah. coming. I don't think they're there forever. I never had the idea that they were staying there. Um, uh -huh. And um, there were drafts that followed them in much more detail, but, um, and there, were, there, was, there was a draft, in fact, the first, the first version, excuse me, that I sent off to my American editor ended with Sarah climbing the style out of, uh, out of grounds of Pemberley and going looking. Um, we didn't even know if she ever found him. I knew she'd found him, because, but my editor sent the book back and said, so what happens next? And I said, well, they do this. And she, well, she, she finds him and then they do this, they do that. And she will go and write that because we need to know. So I wrote that, but I wrote it much more lengthily than the version that you've got. And I don't know if this is showing you too much of behind the curtain and the little person playing the organ, but um, it, it, it had to just, I had to 
pare away a bit at um, their con on ongoing lives. But I had this very clear sense of how they would live and how they'd have to live. So when they go back, really what is happening is Sarah being, for me, this is Sarah's decision as much as anyone else. We are going to go and bring this baby to Mrs. Hill because Mrs. Hill needs to get a go with this baby. Um, and um, it's a visit and then they're moving on. And I, in my mind, in my mind, <laughs> for what it's worth, they're wrapped up in the Chartist movement by now and they're living that sort of autodidact lifestyle that they are working um, around and about sort of traveling, staying, keeping their heads down, staying fairly low. The, the, the immediate threat, as far as I'm aware, sort of historically, um, the once the war was over, I believe it was no longer a death thing. You wouldn't be executed for it. But I think just keeping quiet and keeping your head down um, would have been the way they'd have continued. But not, it would have, you know, I had this quite happy but quite nomadic existence for them in my life, in my life, in my mind. Um, maybe that's for another, <laughs> maybe I need to ask some more stuff. <laughs> But it's, as I said, it's just a visit. They're not there forever. Okay. They're moving on. Yeah. yeah. They're just bringing the baby there. All yeah. right. Well, thank you for delving into that a bit. So we'll get into a couple <laughs> more, you know, more fun questions for a minute instead of the heavy handed stuff for a second. So which character in Longbourn are you most like? Polly. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Polly. Yeah. <laughs> You're um, running off, getting out of work, going in, you know, yeah. out of nature. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think that kind of triad actually of Polly, Sarah, Mrs. Hill. I'm channeling quite a lot of myself and my various roles as sort of daughter, you know, woman, mother kind of thing into all into all three of them. Um yeah. But yeah. I, I Polly's um I, I enjoy Polly's cussedness um, quite a lot. And I think I'd probably be, be better expressing more of that, um, the way that she does than, um, than I do perhaps, but yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so just trying, I'm kind of keeping an eye, so I'm skipping a few of these I sent you. So do you think there are stories that could be told from the servant's perspective within other households in the Austin world? And if so, which might be another novel that maybe you would like to bring to life yourself or see someone else bring to life? Um, I I struggle, you know, you sent these to me and I, I couldn't really, I, it would be such a job of work to find mm -hmm. one. I don't see why you couldn't do it. But for me, you what mattered about Longbourn was their story. Yes. So it would be needing to find that there is a potential subquel, another story that would balance against or weave through this other, the, the Austin, the one existed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I, I don't want to do it again. Um, yeah immediately I don't have the urge this was me answering a question and finding a space for myself within Austin's world um and I wouldn't want to sort of take a formula and apply it mm -hmm. weirdly the next two books that I wrote were kind of the same thing though they weren't anything to do with Austin so the next one was about Samuel Beckett's and the second world war and I was really fascinated by him and and how different his early work and his late work was and there's a weird novel in the middle that's different again. And the war happened. And I just wanted to explore the sort of the making of the, the writer there and the making of the man. And then the next one was about, about the problems I have with crime fiction and the way we keep making stories about dead naked women, bodies, silent bodies. Um, so really they're all sort of literary questions that I'm struggling to answer those three novels. Um, but I do think this thing of writing back and, and writing, writing into other existing texts is a really fascinating thing to do. And we saw the Arthur Miller play last night and I came away thinking, well, yeah, I mean, it's amazing, but I kind of like to see that from Abigail's point of view as well. Mm. You know, a kid who gets kicked out having had an affair with um, uh, John Proctor. You know, I mean, it's just you shift the perspective and everything shifts. And 
uh, that absolutely fascinates me. And yeah, and a lot of Victorian novels you could do this with as well. I think maybe, um, um, I think maybe Austen's particularly primed for it because she doesn't do that, you know, very soon after her, you've got the big social novels like Dickens and, and, and George Eliot and people like that who wrote across class. Mm -hmm. um, and so by that point, you know, those stories are embedded in, in, in with the other narrative. So it's sort of the possibility of doing that kind of falls away. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, I'm not, not sure if many of you guys have heard this and I'm hoping I'm not overstuffing anything by asking, but what can you tell us about the upcoming adaptation? I don't know if it's film or TV of Longbourn because it is up on IMDb. I don't know whether it says it's in production. So what news can you share with us or is there any news to that you can? It's we sold the we sold the film rights before the book was even published. Okay. And there is as yet no film. Uh, um, and it was a film, the, well, it is, the, it's rights to make the film that have been sold. The process has been very slow. It's been held up by um, changes of, like we initially sold it to Focus Features and James Seamus there. Um, and then there was sort of changes of personnel and people, it was bought by somebody else. And it's just been a very, very long and slow process. Um, and we're not, we're not there yet. Um, and I actually don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and okay. I'm, I'm having a meeting fairly soon with um, production. Um, you know, um, I th IMDb will be updated at some point, and at then probably point. I will know at the same time as you what's, yeah. what's going on. Um, <laughs> It, it, it goes through waves of being extremely exciting, absolutely thrilling. And you think, yes, this is going to happen. And maybe they'll let me be in the background wearing some scruffy, like, you know, maybe <laughs> a peasant or something in the background or, or one of the matrons at the ball, you know. Um, and then it just goes into these longers, these silences. And COVID's hit it, Brexit hit it, because it's a co-production with um, Studio Canal. Um, and when a you know a French company came on board, I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. That like a Parisian um, production house was getting involved with my stuff, but it still hasn't happened. So we'll see. We'll cross our fingers with you and hope. <laughs> Ding Hollywood and movie making and everything else. Nothing goes smoothly. So all right. Well. Obviously, you can't tell us much more about that than what we already know. So what can you yeah. give us any hints or insights about your next writing project? Um, well, um, there's sort of three things briefly to talk about. The Midnight News, which I'm just currently proofreading. Um, in fact, it's sort of lingering behind the, is there on my, my computer screen just behind you, still up. Um, and that's coming out in, in May, I think, in America um, with Knopf. And it's a story, it's set during the Blitz, the first few scary or terrifying weeks and months of the Blitz. Um, and the main character um, begins to feel that there, she's sort of, there's a pattern to these deaths, that it's not just the bombs that are falling from the sky, but there's someone preying on people in the blackout. Um, but she can't really trust her own uh, perceptions of things um, and I'm still learning how to talk about it <laughs> so it's a kind of um, it's a mystery and it's a love story um, my I was really interested I get really fascinated by innocent love stories those sort of like um, early you know young love young love so you know Peter Parker and MJ um Charlie and Nick and I don't know if you guys know Heartstopper but it's huge here and those things just utterly just destroy me and I wanted to write something that was kind of about innocent love new, young love but but for people who just consider themselves unlovable mm -hmm. um so that's where that book began so that's kind of done ish um I'm writing a sequel to it mm. um working title is The House in Galloway, but I don't know if it's going to be that. So it's the same characters, but a bit further on. 
Um, and then this is for me, it's really exciting. Um, we work, uh, we, me and my daughter are working on a graphic novel together. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So this is completely brand new to us. I'm channeling everything that I loved when I was growing up, all the books I used to devour. Um, cause my the era I grew up in, in Britain was brilliant era for kids fiction. I don't know if Susan Cooper translated over there, well not translated, but like arrived in America, um, Joan Aitken, like just wonderful historical mythical stories. Um, who else? Anyway, um, uh, Alan Garner, who is still writing even today in his nineties. Um, and my daughter just loves graphic novels. So she devours graphic novels. And we've kind of put these two things together and we've come up with just, generated just sparked off ideas between us that we should write this thing and um it's going to be set in the lake district which is if it was daytime you could see from my window um and it's a kind of um forgive me but the pitch really would be swallows and amazons meet stranger things so uh, <laughs> we're going for this kind of dark mythological um but very much grounded in this place and this time um, and I've got to learn a whole new way of writing to do it, a whole new way of thinking about story. Um, but it's so much fun to write. We're just really, really enjoying writing and just generating these characters and putting them together and putting them in difficult situations, um, mm -hmm. making things hard for them. It's a lot of fun. That's fun. So is your daughter more writer? Is she more artist or? She's, she's a visual um, okay. I mean, she's she's fourteen. She's not like she's 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 still a kid. She's just we're working together. I don't think she'd end up drawing it. I think we'll need to get an artist oh, to like professional. Yeah, you know, she's got exams. So okay. um, at this point, we're just we're just sort of I write stuff, she draws stuff, we compare, um, she reads what I'm writing, we do mood boards, you know. So again, a bit like with Longbourn, it's like a fun craft project that we're we're doing together um and if by the end of it we've just had a nice time then th that will be plenty um mm. so you know either way it's good that's a lot of fun what a great little bonding between the two yeah. of you <laughs> <laughs> all right and then last but not least uh before we open up questions to everyone else and again feel free start putting stuff in the chat um just can how, can you tell us how people can follow you and your work what social media you're on your website do you have a newsletter anything that we can follow you and what your upcoming stuff is yeah. i'm not really massive I'm, I'm hints of this throughout like i tend to avoid um i'm an avoidant type <laughs> Um, you can find me on Twitter. That's where I mostly am, but I'm now considering leaving Twitter just because of what's going on. So, but currently on Twitter and it's just uh, at Joe Baker writer. Um, but you'll most mostly find me complaining about trains um, <laughs> and the current government here. Um, but yeah, but you can say hi there. And like I do post about work and people say, sort of share stuff. Um, uh, like that, you know, book stuff happens as well there when I'm not complaining about trains. So yeah, Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter. All right. That's the best place to find you. Wonderful. All right. So we'll go ahead and open it up for questions because we're just a little bit after 11. We'll keep it no later than 1130 here, 730 your time. So you don't miss your husband's uh, dinner that he's making for you right now. <laughs> Good for him. Um, so I'm going to pull up the chat here and just see if we have any questions that people popped in. So we got some nice comments going on. Um, so uh, here's a question from Carol. She's asking, of course, since Persuasion is your favorite, um, did you uh, watch Netflix recent version of Persuasion and what it was your thought on it? You'll have seen by the cringe that I didn't. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if, if you did. Um, I saw the trailer and I decided not to. Um, I think I'm a lot sure. of people decided not to at that point. So <laughs> I'm sure it was a lot of fun if you didn't, if you'd never read the book. Um, but like it just, it just felt so off. Like the sort of kooky, manic pixie dream girl version of um, of Anne. It just, it just didn't. I couldn't, I, and I didn't. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. It's no, not every adaptation is for everyone, and that's all right. So, <laughs> it's 
like a waste of good frocks and lovely houses, really. Um, no. but, um, you know, it's yeah. not. And as, as I said, it probably a lot of fun if you'd never read the book. And right. and if that maybe just pulls people in, and and then they pick up the book afterwards, then that's that's a good thing. Um, I agree with you. That's why I kind of yeah. think about adaptations that I don't like. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe it brings somebody to Austin and the source yeah. material. So. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so we have a question from Holly. Um, she would love to know more about the expansion of Wickham's dastardliness, because of course you go yeah. to a little bit more. Um, he's so bad. She's got that in all caps. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious about the decision to make him the villain in Longbourn and make him yeah. even worse than, uh, again, yeah. hints are there in PMP, but worse than yeah, yeah. even he's, Austin he's, kind of showed him. He's not just a cad, he's a creep, isn't he? Mm -hmm. um, yes, he is a creep. That's putting it mildly. Um, it was because, now obviously legally and sort of psychologically or intellectually, these distinctions didn't exist in the same way at the time. But looking back, maybe being a bit presentist about things, if you look back and you see the age of the girls that he preys on. Um, now, obviously, we, you know, when he, we're talking about Georgiana, Georgiana? Yeah. No, that's not her name, is it? What's her Georgiana name? Georgiana Darcy? Yes, 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 Georgia. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just having um, my brain just kind of scrambled with Jane Eyre there for a minute, um, and I got wondering if I was talking about the wrong characters. <laughs> um, yeah, so Georgiana is fourteen, I believe, when he um, tries to elope with her, um, and that's really creepy. <laughs> um, and it was again, it's just like as with so many aspects of Longbourn it was just that little clue the age of the girls that he I don't know how old Mary King is I think she's probably a bit older but he's got no compunction no qualms about about preying on very young girls um and in that you know it could be read as fortune hunting just pure and simple but it could also be read as something even darker and that's what I did sorry <laughs> <laughs> and, and how old was it how old was Polly again in the story? Eight? Seven? No, 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 no. She's she was, um, she was older than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's okay. um, I I can't remember exactly now, God. Sorry. That's um, okay. I would say she's she's maybe 13 or something oh, like that. Okay. It's still she's, young, so younger than Georgiana, younger than Lydia still. Yeah. yeah she's young teen, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's another one in here, another one from Holly. She also would love to know more about the decision to explore so much of James's life abroad. It's the one part yeah. of Longbourn that really has little grounding in Pride and Prejudice, other yeah. than obviously the Napoleonic War is going on in the background, but. Yeah. Well, it was that, I mean, I did, you know, and I had to cut it back, but I did, I did go there and it's where Austin doesn't go, but the whole of the world that Austin's operating in the, that her fictions operate in is constrained by um european war um but it doesn't intrude into the novel um it constrains it it, it surrounds everything that's going on but it's on it's more or less unspoken and even the militia as i was saying before the militia's presence there isn't really to do with an external threat it's to do with an internal unrest which itself can be read as partly caused by the economic impact of the war um its presence there really is to articulate its absence <laughs> this huge unspoken thing in and around pride and prejudice i do think of meriton and, and longbourn as this kind of the, the world that the, the characters operate in it feels like a bubble it does to james as well it's almost like james is aware when he arrives that he's entered a fiction a sort of something that's separated off and and self-contained and yeah it, it's it, it's almost like it's 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 very absence in Pride and Prejudice is what made me want to go, hello, look, this enormous flipping thing is happening. This huge thing is happening. It's massive and it's destroying people. And it is, you know, transforming lives in, in hideous ways and, and, leave, and, and as every war does, producing a generation of traumatized young men. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I did it. And I think the thing is like, I can understand that it might annoy some people that I did it, but um, 
you know, there are other, other, other novels can are also available, you know, and can be written. It's just these are the things that fascinated me. Really, Longbourn is subtitled, these are the things that fascinated me, and close brackets. <laughs> um, but it was, it was that, that, you know, something that isn't being said, the elephant in the room, the mm. big sort of warrior, warlike elephant in the room, um, got to, you know, lumber around for a bit in the middle of this novel. And I, I remember thinking as I sort of got to that bit and started to write it that I, I got to that bit and you turn the page and it was like, I wanted to put a bomb in the middle of this, like this safe world. Like there was a bomb that would go off because, um, gosh, if anyone's monitoring Twitter, uh, Zoom for potential <laughs> terrorist language, <laughs> I just really stop myself, I? Um, in, in metaphorical terms, I wanted to explode that world because that world was, you know, surrounded by all this bloodshed and chaos, and it doesn't intrude into it. So that's why. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's your story. Yes, it's okay. It. Yeah. Yeah. It. <laughs> um, got a question from Diana on the chat. She said, do you imagine that Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Hill continue to be companions sitting in the library in the evening, sharing a glass of wine and conversation? And does Mrs. Bennett know about them? And what does she think of it? Um, I, I don't think they get on terribly well anymore. Um, I think they maybe have moments of um, sort of melting or reduction of, you know, there are moments when they sort of have to come together because of their connection and, and the sort of the aftermath, as it were, of their connection. But um, I always imagined as everyone in Pride and Prejudice also seems to imagine that Mr. Bennett would go first. And so that in fact, in my mind's eye, I can more imagine um, sort of, I don't know if this would work with the entail, but I could imagine um, Hill and M Mrs. Bennett being companions more than Hill and Mr. Bennett. And that like that's sort of the, the very sort of nurturing quality that, Hill has that she she does feel that is turned towards Mrs. Bennett as well. Um, but no, I, I think things have gone too far, really. As I said, I think there are moments of connection, but I don't see them as as you know that's, that's something that is in their past. I think. Right. Well, if anyone has any other questions, it's the last one I see in the sh chat. You're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question directly if you would like to. Uh, Joe, we'll give her no more than like 10 more minutes so she can <laughs> get to dinner tonight. But if you guys do have questions, throw it out there. Um, well, and this has just been really wonderful, Joe. Thank you so much for Thank you. answering all these questions. And Oh, does somebody have a question? I would just like to say how much I enjoyed this talk and how much I really enjoyed the book. I read it several, oh, maybe five years ago, and it kind of went over my head, but I went back and, and read it more closely this time. And um, I found this, the part about James being in the war, it's almost so painful that I had to kind of skim through it because of the details. It was well written, but you know some things yeah. that just kind of upset me. The question I had is about the ending. I mm -hmm. I just couldn't understand why they would come back to Longbourn. You said something about they wanted to give Mrs. Hill a chance, a go at the baby. Mm -hmm. I didn't catch that from the reading. Uh, I guess I need to go back and reread it. But why would they come back there, and what would their future be? Because most of the children are gone. They don't need yeah. any more housemaids. What would she do there? Well, exactly. They're not staying. Um, the idea is that they see they live a fairly itinerant lifestyle, which okay. which is fairly normal. So traveling tradespeople right. you know, just move on from town to town and work and move on and work and move on. So um, and they would have a sort of network that that would develop with their political and intellectual engagements, which not all of which entered into the novel in the end. Um, but they're really not there permanently. They're um, there because Sarah knows that Mrs. Hill had to give up her baby. Yeah. And she and that she's been heartbroken about that. And then she lost James 
the adult James again. Right. Um, and so f- for me, that the, what that's about is Sarah repaying or, or offering back a, a love that Mrs. Hill has been denied, that she gets yeah. to be grandma, if not, not all the time, not forever, but she gets to hold this baby and love this baby. Um, oh, I so it, so your again. intention was it was not it was just a temporary visit yeah. to Longmore. Oh, okay. it's just a visit. They just come in the same way as James sort of arrived on the Drovers Road at the beginning. Um, right. in, a, in he was he'd been in this itinerant kind of itinerancy was quite a common phenomenon at the time that you would mm. move on a seasonal work or or you know when you, your trade was in demand you would move on. And so my idea is they just keep moving on and they just keep moving on. Um, and that it's not, it's not bad. It's not a bad way to live. Um, but they are there just to, here you go, grandma. <laughs> is the That's idea. That's true. And it is her grandchild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank Any you. other? Thank you, Carol. Any other questions that I, you would like to unmute yourselves and ask Joe while we have her here? We're definitely getting lots of thanks, and this was lovely and wonderful discussion in the chats. So, I can I just gush for a minute? I <laughs> Go for it, Holly. Love, I, I love Longbourn. I read it when it came out. Um, I'm the one who asked about Jane's. I love military history. I was so thrilled that you um, explored that. Um, I led a discussion for our chapter on Longbourn a month or so ago. And it's just so good. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the best uh, Austin adjacent work. It's, it's a gift. It's just such a lovely, lovely novel. Oh, well, thank you. Um, you've, yeah. Uh, I fill up really easily these days, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I didn't catch your name. I'm Holly. I'm oh, Holly. Holly. And so I... Of course you're Holly. Thank you so much, Holly. Yeah. That yeah. means the world. Because like it's a very, it's a very exposing thing to to have done this. And I didn't realize what I was doing when I did it or how exposing it would be. <clears throat> um, but it means I... the world to me that you you feel yeah. that way about it. And I almost was an Austin scholar. My uh, mm-hmm. my PhD is in uh, contemporary American literary nonfiction. But if I hadn't done that, I would have been an Austin scholar. I've read Pride and Prejudice probably 18 times. Mm-hmm. Your book is so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Yeah. We do have another question in the chat. We'll end it with this one. Kylie is unable to uh, unmute her mic for some reason. So um, she loved the decision to make Mary more of the overlooked Bennett sister than the ugly duckling. Why did you make that choice? Yeah, um, again, I think it's just a shift of perspective. Um, I just had this notion of like what it would be like to be that middle child and to have like this, you know, this, the local beauty um jane and the renowned local beauty and the this sort of sparky be- still beautiful always still beautiful but like um the brilliant you know sparkling wit of of you know these amazing pairing of elder sisters that you can't, oh my god you're so amazing and then this kind of bundle of ribbons and giggles and 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 mischief that is her two younger sisters i just had this sort of sense of her alone between these two pairs very much alone um i do think sometimes those big families that, that dynamic can happen that you get pairings and and my, my brother's got quite a big family and you see it that some children end up not necessarily always but for a while more solitary than others and I just had this sense of her alone between these sort of stellar creatures and then these sort of this this you know like a cartoon where people are having a fight and it's just like you know like feet and arms and ribbons and ringlets and and it was that that's where it came from yeah Thank you so much, Joe, for everything. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wonderful book that you've left us. We, you know, I've got my copy right here. Of course, the American version of it, but it's That's just fun to a anyone. Pleasure. That's my favorite cover. Oh, it is? That's yeah. your favorite cover? Oh, it's a beautiful <laughs> yeah. cover. It really I mean, is. 
this one's nice, but that one's better, I think. Yeah. It is a beautiful cover. So, well, we appreciate you taking your time, staying up a little later, maybe doing a late dinner for us and just taking the time. It really is a beautiful novel. It was a wonderful presentation and fascinating just learning about your process for it. So thank you for your great questions. Really, thank really you. insightful questions. Really helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So thank you all for coming today and listening to Joe. And I hope you all just have a wonderful time.